Great our God. 
Well, good morning and welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. Uh, sorry you couldn't be here today, but always good to be with you there at home, uh, perhaps in the living room. Hope you have uh, been able to worship right with us today. Today we're going to talk about maintaining Thanksgiving joy at this Thanksgiving season. It's a good thing to be thinking about uh, Thanksgiving joy in our life. Now, if you've uh, been in the stores uh, lately, maybe beginning to think about uh, Christmas, you have perhaps discovered that there are not too many happy faces. Of course, most of the faces you're not able to see today. But there just seems to be a lot of heavy hearts and grim faces in the world today. Even in the Christian world, you sometimes find a lack of the thankful and joyful spirit that we are meant to have. Someone said that a lot of Christians uh, look like they have just been baptized in vinegar. Well, I don't know about that. That's just what someone said. Because there just isn't a lot of real joy, even among Christians today. Now, something we want to think about today is why do so many Christians lose their joy? Why do they give up the spirit of thankfulness in today's world? You know, we seem to start the Christian life off filled with great enthusiasm. We have a lot of love for other people. It seems like, but it seems as time goes by, we begin to lose some of that joy, some of that thankful spirit. And uh, life becomes more of a routine without much joy, without much enthusiasm, just trying to make it from one day until the next often unthankful for even what we have, even during these days of crisis. The truth of the matter is there are a lot of things in life that can rob us of our joy if we're not careful when it comes to living the Christian life. Our circumstances can be bad, like they are now perhaps with the virus, and we think, well, you know, if I could just change my circumstances, I could be happy. I could be thankful again. I could be joyful. Or we get the idea that uh, if we could somehow just change our circumstances, that would help. Or if we could get, get rid, rid of, of our, our problems. problems. <laughs> <laughs> Have, Have you, you ever tried, tried getting rid of your problems? Almost impossible. One comes after another. But I think one of the reasons why Paul wrote this portion of Scripture was to give us some help in maintaining thankfulness and joy in the living of our Christian life. Because that is meant to be a great asset, really, in living the Christian life. And we are to have that no matter what kind of a circumstance we may find ourselves in today. Now, the idea of joy is a reoccurring theme in the book of Philippians. In fact, it's mentioned 17 different times. So the Apostle Paul must have thought, well, that's pretty important for people to have that thankful and that joyful spirit. Now notice in verse 1 he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Now I, I kind of get a kick out of that uh, word finally right there because that's like him saying in conclusion. He's only halfway through his letter. <laughs> And he says, finally, you know, that's kind of like uh, us ministers, isn't it? When we say, now in conclusion, you know what that means, don't you? Well, you're right, nothing. <laughs> but now he says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Paul is concerned about the joy, the enthusiasm in the life of these Christians. And so in this passage, he gives us three safeguards, three safeguards against losing this spirit of thankfulness and joy in our life. So first of all, Paul says, if we want to maintain our joy, we must omit the legalistic spirit. We need to resist that. What he's saying is that uh, legalism is a killjoy. It'll destroy the joy in the Christian life. 
It'll do away with the thankful spirit. It'll ruin families. It'll ruin individuals. It can even ruin churches. In fact, I've, uh, I think down through the years, I've, I've been in some of those churches that had lost their joy and lost their thankful spirit. Now let's look at the definition of legalism. Legalism is substituting rules and regulations for my relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, legalism can come into our lives or into a home or into a church kind of slowly. In a way, we don't even realize perhaps that is happening. What happens is it tends to get our focus off of Christ and off of a relationship with Christ onto other things. And when we get this focus flipped around, we have a tendency to lose our joy. How many people have you known who started off with a lot of joy and a lot of thankfulness in the Christian life And then someone came along who said they were more mature, more spiritual in their Christian life. And they began to say say something to you like, now if you really want to be a Christian, if you really want to be spiritual, here's a list of 992 other things that you really need to be doing. And so that person begins to focus on 992 other things instead of their relationship with Jesus Christ. And the next thing you know, joy is gone. The thankful spirit is gone. Now this isn't just a modern problem because if you go back in the New Testament, the loyalists were called Judaizers, Judaizers. Judaizers were a group of people who said, yes, yes, believe in Jesus Christ. Give your whole heart and life to Jesus Christ. But then they would say there are some things that aren't mentioned in the Bible. Not only in principle, not only in literal word. They're they're not mentioned in the Bible. But if you really, really want to be a good Christian, Here's a list of things you need to be doing. In fact, they said, you must keep every one of the Jewish laws to be a good believer. You must keep the Sabbath laws. You must be circumcised. You must keep the dietary laws. You see, they had many, many rules beyond what God said in his word, even in principle or in literal word. And when Paul uh, heard about the Judaizers, he got his righteous indignation up. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, one of the things he is doing is attacking the Judaizers that are trying to steal the joy, the enthusiasm, the thankfulness of knowing Christ in a personal way. Look at verses 2 and 3 there on your worksheet. In the Living Bible, it says this, Watch out for those who do evil, those dogs, men who insist on cutting the body. We worship God by his spirit and rejoice in our life in Christ Jesus. We do not put any trust in external ceremonies. You can almost sense the anger, can't you, when you read those words of the Apostle Paul? He's saying, you guys, you dogs, you know better than to be telling people all of these things. Now, in today's world, when we think of dogs, we think of a good pet. (laughs) I know some of you have dogs, and they're good pets, and you love them. And so that's kind of what we think about. But back in those days, dogs were wild scavengers. And they would even attack human beings and cause great harm. And so the Apostle Paul says, anyone who tries to steal your joy, anyone who tries to steal your enthusiasm and your thankfulness by adding rules that are not in the Bible 
either in literal word or maybe even in principle. He's saying they are like dogs because they're not in your best interest. So here is safeguard number one. If you want to, main, if you want to maintain your joy, live each day in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, a relationship with Christ is the key. It is the key to joy. It is the key to enthusiasm. Now Paul, in the next few verses, uses his own life as an example. What he says to them, he said, now if you want to talk about legalism, if you want to talk about rules and regulations, <laughs> I've got you outdone. I've tried all the rules, he's saying, all the regulations, and it didn't work. It didn't save me. It didn't make me into a new person. Look at verses 4 through 6. It's not on your worksheet, but I think we have it on the uh, overhead projector. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, he said, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, he said, I was faultless. See, Paul's saying, I kept every rule. I kept every regulation. And he says to these Judaizers, hey, if you want to compare list, I have you beat by a mile. I was a super legalist. I kept all the rules. You see, he pulls out his religious pedigree and says, just see if you can top this. this. These Judaizers that are talking to these new Christians, trying to weight them down with all these rules and regulations. He said, hey, I have had more of them than you. They don't work. Now he gives us five different areas to think about. So I think it's important for us to think for a minute. How do we know if we're falling into trusting in rules and regulations more than trusting in Jesus Christ. Well, he gives us five things for us to think about. Number one, he said you begin to trust in ritual. You begin to trust in ritual. Notice he said they're circumcised on the eighth day. That was a Jewish ritual. Now today we have our own rituals in the Christian community. We say things like, um, I was baptized as a baby. Now, of course, that doesn't save us. We get baptized because we have put our faith in Christ. Or we say, I, I took communion for the first time. Now I'm, a really a, I'm really a Christian. Or I went through catechism class. Or we might say, well, we do such and such in our, we, we have a little ritual that we go through every Sunday in our church. Now Paul says, when you begin to trust in those things, instead of trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone for your salvation, that's when you begin to head for trouble. That's what takes away your joy, your thankfulness, your ambition. And then he says, number two, don't trust in race. He said, I was the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, he used to trust in his heritage. And of course, that, that doesn't work. He says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Interesting, isn't it? I sometimes hear people do some of the same things today. They will say uh, like this, well, my dad or my mom, they were good Christians. 
kind of trusting in their heritage, see. I've even heard people say, well, I'm okay because my uncle was a pastor. After all, that's important. You see, you can get religion by osmosis. But you can't get Jesus by osmosis. There's a difference. And that is a little bit of what's wrong with us in America today. And then thirdly, he's saying, I don't trust in religious practice alone anymore. He said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a religious person. Religion is really man's attempt to get to God. And we try to get to God by works, by rituals, by living to the letter of the law for our salvation. Today we might say, I'm really spiritual because I work hard in the church. I have certain views about things. I dress certain ways. That's part of my salvation we might say. But when I begin to trust in these things to save me and give me the abundant life instead of Christ, that's when I begin to lose my joy and my enthusiasm. You see, the coming of Jesus Christ in the world was really so that he could get inside of our lives. Not only save us, but make new people out of us. He's talking about a relationship with Christ on the inside, not because of all of these external things that I've made a part of my life. Did you ever talk to a stranger somewhere along the way and during the conversation you said something like this, well, uh, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And they'll answer something like this, well, we belong to the Lutheran Church or the Methodist Church, or the Catholic Church, or the Baptist Church, or some other church. What you were asking is, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you personally know him? Do you know he has forgiven your sins? Do you know that he lives within you and that his presence is making a difference? That's what you were asking. You see, that doesn't come from practicing certain things in the external. Just the external practice doesn't put us in touch with the living Christ. Fourthly, he says, I don't trust in rules anymore. In regard to the law, he said, I was a Pharisee. In other words, he kept the law. The Pharisees were spiritually elite. They took the Ten Commandments and they expanded them. Out of those Ten Commandments, they come up with 619 other rules and regulations for people to keep. Isn't that something? All man-made. All man-made. Did you know that a Pharisee would not even eat an egg that was laid on the Sabbath? Because that'd be work. If someone got bit by a mosquito on the Sabbath, they couldn't even scratch it till the Sabbath was over because that'd be work. Women were prohibited from looking into a mirror on the Sabbath because they might see a gray hair and pull it out. Hey, part of the 619 rules. Paul said no more. No more. We don't want any more of that. Fifthly, he says, it's wrong to trust in your reputation. Here's what he said, as for zeal, persecuting the church, legalistic righteousness, faultless, no one could point a, ping, a finger at the Apostle Paul. Today we have people who say things like, well, look at all that I do. I met a man one time who wanted spatial treatment, and here's what he said. 
I give more time and more money to this church than anybody else. That's legalism. He was saying, I'm a little superior. I'm a little higher than you because I think I have given more time and more money to the church than anyone else. That's legalism. Now the point is, there's not necessarily anything wrong with all these things. The problem comes when I think that they give me points with God or make me a little more spiritual than others who don't quite fit into the groove. Now look at Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. He wrote the Romans and he said, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now Paul is saying that Christianity is not a matter of rules and regulations, like what do you eat? You see, if the Christian life was just a bunch of don'ts, all the people who are dead could be a good Christian. They don't do anything. If that's all it meant to be a Christian, is don't do this and don't do that, the Christian life is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So number one, if you want to maintain your joy in Christ, resist trusting in legalistic attitudes. Number two, we need to reevaluate sometimes our activities. Because he says a lot of people are looking for joy in the wrong places. And he compares the value of things and religious practices alone with the value of a personal relationship with Christ. And he says, there's just no comparison. No comparison. Paul had been a religious person, but he was lost. He was lost. Look at verses 7 and 8. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. For the sake of Christ, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things and consider them rubbish that I might know Christ personally. Now notice here some important words. Circle the word profit and the word loss. This is kind of uh, Paul's profit and loss <laughs> statement here. And he says, all these things I just talked about, I used to practice. I consider them loss. I consider them worthless when it comes to knowing Christ as my personal Savior. Paul said all these things add up to zero. Here's what the Phillips translation says. I consider it all mere garbage compared to being able to win or to know Christ. Now here's what Paul is saying. Those activities, when I was a Pharisee, those activities that were so important to me, I willingly gave them up. I'm still giving things up, like I give up garbage. Because knowing Christ is worth so much more than keeping all of those rules and regulations. Paul gave up a lot of, by worldly standards, he gave up wealth, virtue of his position as a Pharisee. You see, the Pharisees were very wealthy people. He gave that all up when he gave his life to Christ. He gave up reputation and respect because of his position. Remember, he was getting Christians and putting them in jail. He had a great reputation as a Pharisee. He gave it all up. He forfeited his friends that were on the wrong road. Forfeited his friends. Have you forfeited any friends on the new path? He gave up his physical health and all the things that were considered valuable and worthwhile. 
he willingly dumped them all that he might know Christ as his personal Savior. Not only did he give them up, but in their place he suffered. He was beaten. He had loss of health. He was despised as an individual. And yet he said, the loss of everything is rubbish compared to knowing Christ as my personal Savior. Does Christ mean that much to you? Is everything in life rubbish compared to knowing Christ? Here's safeguard number two. If you want to keep the joy of Christ alive in your life, keep your activities in perspective. Now what's important and things that you shouldn't lose your joy over would be, um, oh, let's say uh, you had a fender bender. Well, don't lose your joy over that. It may be that in your life your plans haven't worked out just like you wanted them to work out. It just, you thought things were going to be different, but, but they're not. But you don't need to lose your joy just because your plans didn't work out. Because the important thing is, do you know Christ? Do you know Christ? In one sense, when you come to Christ, you must be willing to give up everything, everything. And that becomes a stumbling block for many, many people. But listen, that loss is nothing compared to really knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I sometimes have told people, I tell them, uh, I get drunk just as much as I want to. I take all the drugs, all the drugs that I want to take. I go to all the parties, all the wild parties that I want to go to. But here's the thing. When I came to know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, my want-tos changed. The reason I don't do those things is because I don't want to do those things. They've changed. Jesus, the truth, has made a difference in my want-tos in life. How about your want-tos? Have they changed? Has truth taken you in a new direction? You see, when you come to Christ, you willingly give up everything. But on the other hand, life has never been so good. You see, Paul says, knowing Christ is worth more than all the other activities that I used to practice. Hmm. It's more meaningful. It brings more joy, more enthusiasm to my life. Just think of the trade-off for a minute today. When I came to Christ, I gave up guilt. I gained a clear conscience. I gave up worry. I gained power for living. When I came to Christ, I gave up a meaningless life and found real purpose for living. I gave up going to hell, and I gained heaven when I gave my life to Christ. Not a bad trade-off, is it? Not a bad trade-off. You know, I consider that to be good. A lot of times, that which we are afraid to give up is what's robbing us of that spirit of thanksgiving and joy in our life. Reevaluate your activities and interests. And then finally, thirdly, I think we need to refocus our ambition in life. Before lasting joy and thankfulness comes from knowing Christ better and better, look at verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, share, sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. 
Paul's number one ambition was to know Christ better and better. How well do you know him? The word here means to know intimately. It's the same word in the Bible that's used when it says Adam knew Eve and they had a child. Do you have an intimate, spiritually relationship with Jesus Christ? Now, what can we do to know Christ better and better, to maintain joy? Did you ever hear of the story, a boy by the name of Tom, Tommy, who in the middle of the night uh, fell out of bed? And his mom went rushing in to see what was wrong. And she said, Tommy, what happened? What happened? And he said, well, Mom, I guess I just stayed too close to where I got in to bed. I believe that happens to Christians. We just stay too close to where we got in as a Christian. You see, the ambition has to be to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. There are three ways to grow in knowing God. Number one, it takes time. It takes time to develop a relationship with Jesus. We need to spend time alone with him. We need to spend time reading his word, meditating on it so that it becomes a part of our life. Number two, it takes talk. If you want to grow in your relationship with Christ, it takes prayer. We have to take time to talk to God. It takes communication to develop a good relationship with Jesus. You know, if you're married, if you stop talking to each other in your relationship, your relationship dies if you're married. If you stop talking to God, what do you think is going to happen to this intimate relationship that we are to have with Jesus Christ? Look at John chapter 16 and verse 24. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. See what it says? Ask and your joy will be complete. So here's what that says to me. Much prayer, much joy. Little prayer, little joy. We have to talk to God. We have to develop that. And then it takes trust. Relationships are built on trust. And God wants us to learn to trust him. All those problems, all those circumstances that otherwise would beat us down. He wants us to trust in him because he's reliable. He's capable. He is able to handle all those circumstances as he lives out his life in us. Paul says, my number one ambition is to know Christ and to know him better and better. Here's a question for you today. Are you losing your joy? Have you lost the spirit of thankfulness? If so, which one of these three things that we've talked about is killing the joy and thankfulness in your life? Is it legalism? Could it be that legalism has crept into our life somewhere? and has become a substitute for really knowing Jesus Christ in a personal way? How about your activities? Are you giving your life to things that will not last instead of Jesus? How about knowing Christ? Have you made that decision? Have you put your faith in Christ? He's the source of all true righteousness, and joy. That's the way to maintain thanksgiving joy.
joy. And we trust uh, those of you who are home, at home. We pray God's blessing upon your life today. Now today, 